It's the Nighttime Show with your host, Stephen Kramer Glickman, our show mascot, Robbie Carlisle, our house band, Ex Mortis, and our special guest, author of World War Z, The Zombie Survival Guide, and G.I. Joe Hearts and Minds, Max Brooks. I'm your announcer, Mike Black, and this is the Nighttime Show. Robbie, you're here. Um, Robbie is like the mascot of our show. If you've seen any posters or anything for our show, you see Robbie in his full nakedness, uh, usually uh, in just his underwear. And um, nude and rude. Today I get to wear pants. This is great. Wow, I, wonderful. I, I feel good for you, buddy. This yeah. is a big deal, man. Yeah, and um, a shirt. Yeah, so. wow. you sound naked. That's the important <laughs> yeah. part. I just always sound naked. Oh God, <laughs> Robbie! You do a lot of great stuff, and I, I love that you're here. Uh, but let's get to the main dish, the main course. Uh, this guy, you know, you're a, you're a legend in your own time, sir, and you have uh, a, amazing projects happening all the time. Um, a phenomenal author, a uh, hilarious gentleman, a uh, TV writer, a uh, awesome guy in general. Ladies and gentlemen, Max Brooks. How are we doing? Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, thank Woo-hoo. you. Thank you. Thanks but, for joining us. Well, I'm here not as not as an author uh, or anything like that. I'm, I'm pretty much here because I'm your cousin and I owe you a favor. That's true. <laughs> you do owe me a favor. You owe me You owe me a small favor. Cousin a lot of kids favors. at home going, this is how showbiz works. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> That's exactly you how it works. You need a cousin. <laughs> how you been doing, man? I uh, Since we saw each other about a week ago, yes. uh, no, no major complaints. I can tell you that the... <laughs> Video we shot for the comic book. Uh, editor of Avatar Comics loved you, and apparently so did Alan Moore. What? Ooh. Oh my God, that's amazing! That's the Watchman, Alan Moore. The Watchman, uh, Alan Moore. Wow. Known for not that's... really loving anybody. No, <laughs> <laughs> loves Stephen. Yeah. That's that's nice. Thought, to hear. thought it was a it was a great. <laughs> A great advertisement for his new magnum opus. Oh, that's oh awesome. Oh, my God. That's so cool. That Tell us a little bit about this project. Please. It's amazing. Well, we all know uh, Cinema Paradiso, that term. Well, this is Cinema Purgatorio. And this is a horror anthology. Uh, different stories, different comic book stories from Alan Moore, from Garth Ennis, from Kieran Cullen, from I – I don't even know how to pronounce Kieran's last name. Just I call him Kieran Awesome yeah. just because he does shows – he does comic books like uh, Uber – and uh, I got to throw something in there along with Christos Gage, who got me into G.I. Joe. Wow. Cool. That's wow. huge. That's amazing. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, now, I read this. Uh, no, no um, Let's just talk real quick about this Kickstarter because this thing went off the rails. I mean, it is, it's raised so much. They raised so and much They raised money. it in the first day. I mean, I'm not even sure the video we shot. So they went over their goal in the first day. Yeah, I mean, they were trying to raise nine thousand dollars, I believe, or ten thousand dollars, something like that. It was crazy. I think by the time the video we shot that video, and then by the time it was edited within an hour and then sent, it was already not needed. Yeah, (laughs) they are. They raised over a hundred. Over a hundred thousand dollars, I believe, was, or something yeah, it was in, crazy. That, in that realm. That's amazing. That's a nice way to waste time. When you, <laughs> you turn the thing in. We didn't need it. We didn't yeah. need it anyways. But we yeah. like you. We yeah. like you're a sweet kid, and we Alan appreciate. Alan Moore loves you. <laughs> right. That's the important part. It really is. <laughs> It really is. That's uh, that's amazing. You know, I read uh, the G.I. Joe Hearts and Minds, that that thing that you wrote, which is uh, absolutely the coolest thing. If you haven't read it, you got to go out. You got to get a copy of it and check it out. And it's it literally it's like origin stories sort of. Right. It is. It's sort of a mix of origins and a mix of day in the life. It's sort of me thinking like, well, what what would if G.I. Joe was real, you know, going from the Chris Nolan Batman idea. Right. Yeah. If G.I. Joe was a real combat unit and Cobra was a real terrorist organization, who are these human beings and, and what are their days? Wow. And I was not I was not expecting the controversies. I was not expecting the battles writing it. I was not expecting certain responses from fans. God. Uh, yeah, it was it was a crazy, crazy time. What, what were some of the weirder uh, yeah. responses okay. from fans? Well, when uh, the first one I, was a day in the life of uh, Firefly, the Cobra yeah. Saboteur. Sure. Now, when I was a kid playing with the action figures, the only guy in my gang who had that Firefly action figure, because it was a rare one. It was hard to get. Uh, And the only guy who had it was a guy named Richard Cade. So as my shout out to my childhood buddy, Uh uh, I made Firefly African-American. 
Okay. So I wasn't trying to, to break down any barriers here. I right. was literally just like, hey, Richard, if you ever read this, this is for this you. This will be cool. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, some G.I. Joe fans went crazy. They were like, you can't do that. You can't mess with the canon, which is weird because he's wearing a mask most of the time. Yeah. yeah. And then I had, uh, when it came out, I had a friend of mine. His name is Dean Edwards. Uh, and he said to me, he said, dude, you don't know what it was like growing up and playing with G.I. Joes and have everybody saying, you can't be Duke. There's right. like oh, there's man. like 400 Joes. You get yeah. to pick from three. Yeah, yeah. you get to Seriously. pick from Doc Stalker it's, and, and the dude that rhymes and like, his that words. It. Yeah, that's oh my it. God. I knew exactly which three yeah. too, as you were saying. I was like, well, <laughs> and I was like, wow. I mean, it's true. I guess it's true what Louis C.K. says. Like, if you're a white male, you can go in a time machine to the past and just go anywhere. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. And anywhere you'll be accepted. But yeah. it's true. If you're a white dude. There's like 400 GI Joes. You well, couldn't and what be. sucked is you would be uh, other races anyway if you were a white kid. I was always right. Quick Kick or Storm right. Shadow. Exactly. And it's like that's not fair. <laughs> Those are the only two options <laughs> for Clifton <laughs> Moy. Yeah. He, he doesn't get a choice. You know. <laughs> I mean, how much would it suck to be a Native American kid playing GI oh Joe? My it's God. either spirit, it's oh, yeah. spirit or that's it. What about yeah. as a Jewish kid? You know, you just yeah. play the accountant. Yeah, that's no, it. Yeah. <laughs> Larry Goldfarb. Yeah. <laughs> You're the G.I. Joe combat dentist. Right. <laughs> I think I can fix that for you. There's something I can do and put in the new uh, filling and we'll be fine. Well, you know, I made Destro an Israeli arms dealer. He was oh like, my hey, God. my friend, my friend. Oh, my God. Well, he does have his shirt unbuttoned all the time. That's so you, so you draw on a little chest hair. Yeah, very you draw manly. some chest hair. He's wearing a medallion. Hey, Cobra Commander, come on. I fix you up. Be good. <laughs> I get you some new stuff. It's no He's problem good. for you. He's got I got you a nice gold Platinum mask. Head. Yeah. You <laughs> I have silver head. I can get you a nice gold head. Whatever you need, yeah. buddy. Don't worry about it. It's no big deal. <laughs> oh, the, oh my! The joys of GI Joe. I can't believe there's any controversy here. To the, you oh know. yeah, that's awesome. Did now the the one thing that I know is like sacred ground uh, for all GI Joe people. Did you give Snake Eyes dialogue? No, because it, because <laughs> I liked I I like dealing with Joe characters that nobody else dealt with. I, oh, yeah. that's that's <laughs> such a cool. smart move. Yeah, I wrote a whole uh, Joe issue about a guy named Interrogator who I think was an obscure character, probably never even in the comics, and had one. Uh, action figure. Now he was a wow. cobra guy. He was a right? cobra guy, and he came with like a flying. Yeah, and it machine. was it was so lame. He <laughs> it had... was like an old steampunk yeah. style flying machine, yeah. and he had like a mask that hypnotized you. And I'm like, oh, come no. on, oh my god! I'm like, interrogations really, especially now with with Gitmo. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah, I wanted to study what it was like to really interrogate somebody. Well, so mm -hmm. if they do a new figure, he'll come with waterboards now and stuff. <laughs> Funny you should say that. <laughs> wow, really? Hasbro wouldn't let me waterboard somebody. Really? Oh, with you got to tell the story. Yeah. Amazing. So you have I, to tell I showed I showed them initially in the scripting uh, waterboarding a guy, and Hasbro was like, "You can't do that." And I said, "But it's happening." And they said, "That's why you can't do it." I said, "So wow. wait a minute. I can I can stick his head in a bucket of water, and it's the exact same thing. But I can't do that." And they're like, "Yeah." I'm like, "And I can cut someone in half with a laser beam, <laughs> right? But I can't waterboard." And they're like, "No." Terrorism has ethics, man. Well, yeah. that's their point. They were like, well, we don't want to get letters. I'm like, well, what if yeah. you get good letters? What if you sure, get letters yeah. from, from somebody saying like, wow, thank you for G.I. Joe actually portraying the real wars? Yeah. Because it's in the 80s anymore. You right. know, yeah. we, we, yeah. we can't do the A-team where 60,000 rounds go off and nobody, nobody gets dies. hit. Yeah. Yeah, completely. No, completely. Um, how did you pick the characters that you ended up picking? Well, some of them were the ones that I sort of grew up with and loved. Like, I actually did Spirit. The, oh, yeah. the Indian guy. And I Very thought like, cool. well, what if he had something that I've grown up with and a lot of us grew up with and don't know, which is uh, sensory integration disorder, basically where, you know, like when some people you're at a party and you, there are some people that simply can't filter out extraneous noise. Sure. Oh, yeah. And it's just it's too much. You get overloaded. And I thought, what if spirit grew up with that, but it was taken to the extreme. Okay. So therefore he could not be in an environment with any other distractions, but put him out in the wilderness where things are nice and calm. He'll notice little things that nobody else would. Oh, okay. Oh, so that cool. helps him as a tracker. So that helps. It has nothing to do with his heritage. Yeah. In fact, I made him descended from the Anasazi. So even his ancestors lived in cities. He's urbanite to his core. Oh, wow. So he has, so his, his, 
you know, his family, his people, so to speak, they've never been these sort of, you know, dances with wolves folks. Yeah. They've always been merchants and architects and traders. But it's just that this kid noticed too much. Do you still have any of the toys that you had as a kid? Do you have any yes. of them around? I, oh, yeah. I still got uh, some of the old Joes. Yeah. I found my old Han Solo, Empire Strikes Back, my old Chewbacca, and I still have... That was my favorite Star Wars figure, the Empire Strikes yes. Back, Han Solo. And I've got <laughs> the old... Do you remember the old Darth Vader action figure case? Yes. Yeah, of that course. Old, I still got mine. Yeah. No, that's that's a really exciting man. When... Um, when I- like just recently, my mom, um, she coll- she kept all my Star Wars toys from when I was a kid. Like she saved all of my toys, and I've been like bargaining with her for years to get some of my toys. I remember back. she has Mork. Oh, she has she has Mork. She has uh, one of the first Batman action figures that with the rubber head yep. that pops onto the plastic body. Yep. Yep. She has uh, a, the like the first Wonder Woman action figure. All sorts of like weird stuff, like great old stuff that I now, love. Do you know the story of when your mom got flipped off for those toys? No, uh, you, no. This is a story your mom told us. <laughs> she uh, got flipped off. Yeah, she's uh, she's driving and she had. She, you know, she loves toys. She loves yeah, to collect sure. toys. Yeah. So she bought a bumper sticker she thought was cute that says, whoever dies with the most toys wins. Right. <laughs> wow. Hilarious. And she couldn't for the life of her understand why people were flipping her off when she was driving. Oh, my God. She just thought, what? I like toys. What? She had yeah. no idea it was a consumerist, capitalist, <laughs> a-hole bumper sticker. What? <laughs> oh, my God. She literally didn't. Get, she just thought, what? <laughs> and your mom's, and we should say for the record that Stephen's mom's like the nicest Oh, she's she's the sweetest little lady in the whole world. You know, she had um, like just just within like the last few months, I like made a deal with her that if I bought like a big, massive case, we I could have some of my Star Wars figures back. (laughs) I can't have all of them back, but I got my Darth Vader case that was like full of my old toys and my old like X wing and stuff, and they're all sitting in in my uh, in my office now. And I I every day like I'm just like I just I move them a little bit, like play with them a little bit. It's, it, I don't know when's the last time you physically played with toys, but it is like, you have to get your brain to like move back in time a little bit to like let yourself relax enough to be able to play around like hold physical toys and make them do things right. and play around. Dude, not only do I have the original toys, <laughs> I still have the original commercials. Oh, wow. Okay. What? When I was a kid in the 70s, and, you know, my dad worked in Hollywood, so my sure. dad had one of the first VHS players, so he could look at dailies. He could look at rushes at home. Yeah. So my mom bought a bunch of blank tapes and then taped my cartoons for me. And so oh, awesome. she didn't know how to edit out the commercials, so I have the old toy commercials. Oh, and some of those were fantastic, and too. what – oh, all right. First of all, okay, there's two commercials back-to-back, which – the first one is Steve Austin, and yeah. it's two guys with Steve Austin. It's it's the Bionic Man like play set, and he was like, "We gotta check Steve Austin, check his Bionic modules." <laughs> and then <laughs> Bionic guy, a okay, and then he's ready for action. So the point is, he's going on another mission. Right. Next commercial, it's Jamie Summers. It's the Bionic Woman play set. Two girls, and they're like, "Oh, quick, let's check her Bionic readouts." Okay. And now brush her pretty hair because Steve <laughs> Austin's coming over. Oh, my God. So literally the, the point of this playset. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. The point of the playset is to get her ready for a date. Oh, wow. that's the my point of the commercial. God. Wow. <laughs> and you know what's so influential? Those commercials were so influential in oh, teaching yeah. kids how to play with toys, too. Yeah. You know, because like those Star Wars, uh, all the Star Wars commercials were like, this is how you play with it. You build the sand trap and then you can make this like, yeah. you know, they they showed you how to do it. And so for for girls, it was right. definitely like you brush, you brush the hair and you bake a cake. That's it, bitch. That's all you're doing. That's pretty much it. Well, you know what? I uh, Back to my old uh, friend from the day, Dean Edwards, he had a stand up routine where he said, like, look, as horribly sexist as girls toys were, at least they took place in the real world. Sure. You know, uh, what did our toys prepare us for? Fighting Skeletor. <laughs> right. That's about it. Like literally if we walked out right now and and we have to, and Gargamel appears. Yeah. You know, we know what to do. Right. But yeah. that's 100%. pretty much it. Well, to be fair, there are a lot of goths out there. Well, that's true. <laughs> the, 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 not many of them are bodybuilding or carrying right. like a ram's head staff. <laughs> but if that day should happen, 
we're all more than prepared. We're ready for Hordak, and that's yeah. about it. <laughs> I, can't, uh, I can't do my own taxes, yeah. but if the Horde right. invades, I I'm don't, prepared. I would have loved like the male version of the Holly Hobby oven. Who, <laughs> who wouldn't want to learn how to cook something? Absolutely. Those, those cakes always looked really good. And uh, in a way, I need it more. Right. You know, as a single guy, I think I, I needed more cooking lessons than, than any girl did. Yeah why, yeah, why didn't we have that? And they could have called it the G.I. Joe Combat 360 <laughs> Emergency Ready Bake Oven. Field ration oven. You know? Right. And, you know, and then, and then they could have had Roadblock, like, rhyme his words. Like, you know, this oven has a way with a microwave. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been delicious. They would have been making little mini pizzas. Yeah, they because you remember how they did that at the end of every GI Joe, where they were like, "Fighting doesn't solve anything." Or in today's story, how about something like, "Hey, here's how you defrost something without blowing up your microwave." <laughs> oh yeah, you know, um, I had a funny thing happen. Do you remember the? Uh, remember back like in the day on, uh, I think it was like YouTube, like uh, way back, somebody took all those uh, PSAs, the GI oh, Joe yeah, PSAs, and they did their own voiceover. Yeah. And they did, uh, "Who yeah. wants a body massage?" Oh, and they body, did body all massage those. machine. <laughs> So I called Funny or Die and went in and pitched them that I wanted to remake all of those, but live action with WWE wrestlers. Oh, my God. <laughs> and I had like four wrestlers who had said they would do it. And so like I pitched them and they were like, well, who wrote those? And I was like. I don't know some guy who you know is like some inter- like he's like an internet guy yeah. who doesn't exist anymore and they're like you have to find him and you have to get his permission. So I did a bunch of research and I found him and he lived in Portland, Oregon and he was working at like a steam shop or some like steam mill <laughs> metal metal place. Like he was wow. just like like completely retired from everything and I was like look I've got this uh I've got this idea and I pitched to him real hard and um and he he was like, uh, that's the worst shit I've ever heard in my life. I want nothing to do with it. I don't want you to do it. Don't do it. And I had to like go back slowly, quietly back to Funny or Die and be like, he said no. And they were like, well, where? who is he? And I was like, he's just some guy. But he like wanted nothing to do with it. And I guess, I guess it like haunted him for like many, many years after because he had his name right at the end. And so people would like try to you know they always wanted to ask him about it and he just got tired of it wow. but well, i thought those were so funny i'm putting it out there is an escape hatch you can use all of those cartoons had those psas at the end oh yeah yeah what about he-man oh uh, yep. yeah he-man would be amazing right I loved He-Man. Are you a big He-Man fan? Oh, my God. He-Man was awesome because it was the same motions. It was like the 70s Battlestar Galactica where they just redid the same <laughs> yes, footage. Right. And then they just occasionally changed the dialogue, and that was pretty much it. There were so there was many always, characters. He was always going to punch a wall. Yeah. Yeah. He was always like going to run and dodge a laser somewhere. He flipped you know? the sword from hand to hand. There was yeah. a lot of that. Yeah. yeah, yeah and he yeah, would yeah. always laugh. He would yeah. have that big macho <laughs> laugh at the end of each episode. And the funny thing is he, he looked exactly like Prince Adam. Yeah, it, he right. was tanner and shirtless. <laughs> right, yeah, it's the same guy. It's like literally, if I suddenly got a spray tan and walked in the house in my shorts, it's not <laughs> like my wife would be like, "Oh my god, who are you? Call the police!" <laughs> I never could. I never could reconcile either that the power of the universe felt like, well, we better give him a tan too. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like and we're his, giving him unlimited power. It's like his hair Throw color didn't even him. change. No, know? Yeah. he just became more tan, and his voice went down an octave. It was like, oh. Wait to fool us oh god it's man oh man and he was wearing purple tights and a like a, a crushed velvet <laughs> it was like he was dressed by prince yeah <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> prince dressed prince adam before he went out every day <laughs> that's the way to do it he had fur a uh, purple fur loincloth oh. to go on top of his tights oh, that's yeah. very sexy that's a real that's a real good look. Yeah, <laughs> that's it's really what you it's really what you want in a hero. It's a confident look. Yeah, it's you know if you were the most powerful man in the universe, <laughs> right. You could dress. You like could that, do, you do whatever you want. Dress however you want. Look at Prince. Prince yeah. dresses however yeah. he wants. But you know, I don't. I think that that you know that it's a lost art. I don't think kids today have those sort of cartoons that they worshipped and learned from, like no. we did. Like there's a whole generation of us who went through puberty looking at. Uh, at Chitara from yes. the Thundercats. Yeah, dude. Who in the pilot was nude. Yeah. Wow. Through the entire show. And I was mad during the show. She only had like four or five lines in the whole series. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, she was fine though. Because it was now. Here's what I don't understand. <laughs> I hit it. She didn't need to talk. <laughs> here's, here's, a, here's a question I got to throw out here. This has haunted me. Was the voice of Panthro Brock Peters or Cliff Huxtable's dad? It was Cliff Huxtable's dad. It was Cliff it was Huxtable's Cliff. dad. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. That's what I thought. Because, got it. What's All his right. name? Yeah. Earl Hyman. Earl Hyman. Earl. Oh, yeah. Okay, because that's what I thought. I was like, he sounds familiar, but also Brock Peters from Star Trek had a similar voice. Hi, I'm Gilbert Gottfried, because let's be honest, who in their right mind would claim to be me if they weren't? I want to tell you about my hilarious podcast, Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast right here on the Sideshow Network. Each week, me and my co-host, Frank Santo Padre, talk to movie stars, comedians, singers, directors, and other entertainers about classic Hollywood. Sometimes they even answer us. If you didn't catch the name, that's Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast every Monday and Thursday named by the Village Voice as the best podcast of 2015. Download, rate us, and subscribe on iTunes or check us out on sideshownetwork.tv slash Gilbert Gottfried. Listen, I don't want to uh, interrupt the flow here, but we do too have. Late, Steven, I know I'm late. going. I'm going to interrupt <laughs> it because we do have a, a game that we'd like to play with uh, our dear uh, mascot Robbie. That's that's here, uh, Max. I would like uh, your help in this. I'm gonna I'm gonna read these to you. This is a little game that we like to call. Wait, you have to do a little. You have to go like. Doo, 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 doo. You have to like make a little song. Doo, 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 uh, this is a little doo, game that we like to call. Doo, 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 did, did it happen Robbie? to Robbie? Did it happen to Robbie? Because <laughs> you're the best, Mike. It's uh, hilarious. That was short notice. It was perfect. It was, it was great. Um, all right. So uh, these are, uh, I'm going to read you three things, uh, Max, and then you have to decide, did it happen to Robbie? Which one happened to Robbie? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Robbie. All right. Okay. Here we go. Um, <clears throat> num- uh, num- number one. Um, okay. Here we go. Number one. Uh, Robbie got a job offer to be the spokesperson for the Michelin man or got a job offer to be the Michelin man. That's number one. Okay. Um, uh, the number, uh, uh, I guess, uh, option B option B would be, um, uh, the time that Robbie got stabbed in the parking lot of an Arby's or C the time that Robbie got beat up in the bathroom of a Ralph's grocery store. Okay. A, B, or C. Which one? And I'm not allowed to ask follow-up questions. No, it's it, one of the three happened. One of those is a true story. Got it. All right. Which one do you think it is? Hmm. Michelin Man. Stabbed. Stabbed in the Arby's <laughs> parking lot. Or, or beaten. Beaten. Severely. Severely in a Ralph's bathroom. Hmm. Well, you know, he didn't. He laughed at being stabbed. Oh yeah, stabbed is great. But he did not <laughs> laugh about being beaten in in a Ralph's bathroom. Very smart. Very smart. So I'm I'm gonna say Ralph's. That is correct, sir. Yes, it uh, happened Rob- to Robbie. <laughs> it happened to Robbie. Can, can we at least hear this? Robbie, t- can you please tell what, us about what, what happened to what you? What did you do? What uh, happened, Robbie? Okay. Um. So uh, I was in a Ralph's. Uh, I was in the bathroom. Uh, I was taking a shit. And great, buddy. Well, no, no, it's fine. It's part okay, of the story. Well, it's important to the story. All right. Yeah. And uh, this guy starts banging on the door, asking, "Are you done yet?" Right. And like my response is like, I, "I'm enjoying the restroom at Ralph's as much as one can possibly do." Yes. And it, that's it gets, what you said to the man. Well, yeah. I mean, like, hey, okay. Like, there, there's a little bit of a, you know courtesy here right right sure and he's like you are taking too long uh however he was uh hispanic and i don't know if i can do that accent without being offensive yet probably not to now. Na- not today 
Yeah, no, I, I have to do it beforehand. And he says, I swear to God, I'm going to come in there. And I'm like, oh, fuck, what? Like, I'm trying to hurry up. And, like, in kicks this door. Oh, God. Oh, oh no. And, like, this dude was, like, super tall. Like, super tall Hispanic tall. Like, 6'5". Mm. And he looked like a Hispanic skinhead kind of guy. You know what I mean? Like, mm. shaved head, uh, beard, goatee. And... Before I can make a, a smart ass enough comment, he like punches me in the face like three oh times. Oh my god! Yeah. So he didn't even let you ad lib before he just no went no right like into wow. punching you in the face. And I didn't even agree to fisting. So <laughs> so wow. Robbie. Yeah. Oh, no. So Robbie. he did he. <laughs> so what, and then he literally happened? beat the crap out well, of you like, in he, the he, bathroom. I, I, did I, he I, punch I, you again, or was it a one time well, punch? No, it was like it was three punches. Just he like, punched you three times in the face while times. you were taking a shit, and like I was literally shitting with each punch. Oh, oh. my god, no! Like, it, why is this happening? So he literally <laughs> knocked the shit out of you. Yeah. Oh <laughs> my god! And, oh my god! <laughs> wow! Wow! Oh, it gets better. So, um, <laughs> what did you do to defend yourself? Well, I'm a big guy, so I'm like, what do I use my body? So I like just launch up from the fucking toilet, shit sure. just streaming from me. I had oh. Indian food beforehand. Oh so god, that okay. explains why I was on the bathroom for so long. Yeah, and I'm just like my arms around this guy, just like so a bear hug. You went for okay. you went for a bear hug. Well, standard I mean, fat guy combat. That's exactly fine. That's right. Too- yeah, I, mean, I figured you know make love, not war, and sure. You know, I'm, I'm open to a little bit of rough stuff sometimes. So. <laughs> I, you know, I'd like to say in moments like this, I'm very grateful for the for the eclectic life that I that I lead. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it was it was literally uh, t- two weeks ago. I was in Quantico, Virginia, discussing uh, future war fighting policy with the United States Marine Corps, and we were discussing broad macro macroeconomic and political terms and how they would become military solutions of the future. And tonight, I'm hearing about. A gentleman I've never met before getting in a fist fight while taking a shit in the bathroom at Ralph's. So Ralph's on Vermont. That Ralph's, Ralph's, thank you. Thank you for pointing that one out. That's uh, wow. Wow, buddy. Yeah. That's pretty rough. Uh, yeah, it, it, was, it was wonderful because when the security guard walked in, like you, you kind of have to put yourself in that person's shoes. If there's like a naked guy like hugging on a big six foot tall dude who's trying to like beat him off i guess <laughs> oh so he was trying to beat you off i mean well like you know trying to get me off but by hitting oh, he was me. trying to get you off yeah. i understand okay. right well right. i mean it helped beat you unconscious yeah. is what was happening that, that was his end game it was not wow to- yeah well like the security guard didn't know who the real villain was in that right. situation right. So, right. i mean how do you tell who do you right. tase you you've got one shot <laughs> Yeah, I honestly, I'd probably tase the naked guy. Right. That's yeah. the no, no, that, that would be my default position. Is, right. is, yeah. is naked guy with feces? <laughs> right. Yeah. Chance, that's the chances are, yeah, that's that guy, and he just goes down like a sack of potatoes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing is, they're not well. They're not well enough to, equipped. They have no. They don't have a taser. They don't have pepper spray. Right. Like they just have a badge. A badge. A badge that says, "Please don't walk away from me." Right. But, like, that is the amount of power that they have. I could hmm. tell on you. Dude, don't put that out there now. Now yeah. there, there's going to be a... <laughs> now you're going to have even less security here. Right, Ralph. and now yeah. there's there's going to be attacks on I'm Ralph's I'm never now. shitting at Ralph's, ever. I'm never no, going no. to the bathroom at Ralph's. That ever. story that's... scared me straight. I'm yeah. going to the bathroom at Ralph's. Nope, that's the end of that. Uh, yep. That's off nope. the bucket list. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if it can happen to Robbie, it right. can happen to anybody. All right, here's... Now, Robbie, did you sue them? Is it going to be the Robbie's Rock and Roll Ralph's Like, I, I went to a, a lawyer, and he said, here's the thing. Your face is just way too punchable. Like, we we could not convince a jury that hitting you was, like, the guy was in the wrong for it. You know, it's, I I think the lawyer's right. Right, right? Yeah. Like, I'm I'm afraid, like, if I went to trial with it, like, I would just get beat up by the jury. They're like, yeah, it is we, tempting to beat you up mm, right now just after hearing that. Story. Absolutely. Well, you do have a face for punching. Right. Um, here's another one. Uh, this is, we're going to do one more. Is that okay? All right, let's here let's we go. do this. All right. Um, uh, Robbie. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Robbie, uh, either a cried while watching Jurassic World, 
Uh, B, ate so many carrots that he threw up at the mall. <laughs> <laughs> ate so many carrots that he threw up at the mall. Or C, the time that Robbie was almost a terrorist. A, B, or C. Oh, it's got to be C. You are correct again, uh, Max two Brooks. Two, two like, for two. Me eating carrots at a mall. Me eating <laughs> carrots in general. Make it believable, Steven. <laughs> so it should have been Cheetos. <laughs> that makes more sense. <laughs> what happened, Robbie? Tell us the. This is this. You got to tell us this. What oh, happened to Robbie? <laughs> what happened to Robbie? <laughs> Okay, we need um, to have some like songs prepared that play throughout the show. Just a remix. Uh, um, so I, I, I always, uh, I, I always wanted to be a comic as a kid. Um, I did my first stand-up show when I was twelve, and uh, time in uh, two thousand three, like uh, the the Iraq War was going on, and uh, that, that remember that one, uh, uh, the one pastor dude who wanted to kill the president of Venezuela. Like he was this one, like really important. Tr- I sure. Guess, okay. All right. Yeah. I'm with you. Well, uh, I thought it would be funny if I impersonated him and, uh, did my own kind of like preacher kind of guy, uh, that hated the assholes here and you know, all these impure assholes. And there's going to be divine retribution. And he's going to come and there's going to be a list of people who will be divinely purified. Uh, how old were you when you did this? 13. Oh God. In okay. high school. You did this at school. At school. Okay. And, um, a lot of people freaked out. Uh, there were some people who laughed in the hallway and, uh, I remember just, um, being in class and the principal calling just like Mr. Robert Carlisle, please uh, come to the office. And I get in the office and there's the principal and just standing like at his side are like a bunch of guys in black suits, sunglasses. And the principal, I swear to God, asked me, Robbie, do you have weapons of mass destruction? Swear to God. Wow. That's, like uh, they, they honestly thought I had weapons of mass destruction. You were, you came of age during what is now known as the Great Freakout. Yeah. After nine eleven, where, sure. where, <laughs> where basically the whole country did what you did in a Ralph's bathroom once. <laughs> right. <laughs> they just shit themselves yeah. while getting beat up That's by some much, random person. Yes. Trying to hug their aggressor. <laughs> right. Yeah. All, yeah. yeah. Everybody lost their minds that, for a long time. They, we really did. That happened to the entire country. And Everyone it, thought everything was anthrax. Yes. Yeah. And, oh, my you know, God. Just, completely. <laughs> everyone yeah. was a terrorist. Someone would leave their purse in McDonald's, and we were all sure it was going to yeah. blow up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was a huge... That was, it was a, just a nightmare time. Yeah, it really is. But, you know, Robbie, you've come out of it. You've come out the other side. You're looking, stronger for it. Yeah. You're more adorable for it. Oh, all right. You. And... uh and we're we're happy that you're a part of our show. And you have right. a title for your biography now. Right. The- <laughs> face for punching. Fa- face yes. For punching. <laughs> Robbie Carlisle, a face for punching. That's a really good idea for your uh, for your first stand up album when you record that. <laughs> all right. Um all right, so uh, let's uh let's let's move on to one of my favorite things about you, Max, is that you wrote on a, a TV show that is uh, it's legend. It's a legendary TV show and you got to you know, work with some legendary people on a show called Saturday Night Live. Oh, I thought uh, you were going to mention Batman Beyond, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that show. I grew up with that show. I was on that show. What did you do on that show? All right. There was a character. Terry McGinnis had a, a friend named Howard Groot who was only on for about, I don't know, three or four episodes. And yeah. you know how all the other characters were sort of beautifully sculpted, almost anime in their, in their appearance. And then there was a very round guy with wraparound green glasses and a singular wraparound tooth. And that was Howard Groot, and that was me. Wow. Whoa. And that, Amazing. Yeah, it was fun because I got oh. to work with Kevin Conroy. Yeah. Oh, my God. You know, who was cool no matter what he said. Yeah. You know, yes, I'd like fries with that. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Amazing. What a great job. Oh, my God. That's so cool. What other – that was a voice job. That was a vo- – yeah, I used to do voice jobs. What like, other kind you know, of stuff did you do? What other kind of voice uh, jobs? I mean, I think Batman Beyond was sort of the big one. But things like – I think I did an episode of Buzz Lightyear. I think I did uh, something called Wild Thornberries. I did um, – Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I remember that show. Of course. Yeah, they used to do – there was a Starship Troopers like cartoon Roughnecks. I did one of those. I mean, those were – sort of little ones and i i had like one or two lines in the 
the first episode of Justice League. Wow. wow. So Amazing. That one was really good, too. Yeah. And yeah. That, that's cool to sort of sit around with all those people. And the cool thing about Kevin Conroy is because I'm such a big dork, I remember him from the show Tour of Duty. Oh, so wow. I wow. got to sit and talk to him about when he used to do live action, and that was really cool. That's phenomenal. That's, that's cool. He's am- still that's doing the Batman voice to this day. Isn't oh, he? really? I thought they replaced him on that show, The Batman. Well, yeah, but I mean, like, he's doing, like, the video games oh, and stuff good. like that. He's good, still, good. like, somewhere doing Batman stuff. He's, like, he's, he's the real there. Batman voice. Anybody yeah. else is just kind of yeah. Like, he's yeah. who I hear when I read the comic books. Yeah, right, of course. You know? Right, of well, course. That's phenomenal. Um but let's um I, I we uh, we got to we got to jump to uh to Saturday Night Live and the reason we have to jump to it is because we have a special guest here Max uh a cast member from Saturday Night Live that uh is a total surprise that we uh he happens to be in town and I adore the guy I've worked with the guy ladies and gentlemen let's put our hands together for Dean Edwards Woo! Woo! Heat. Yo, what's poppin'? This ain't Dino. This is Tracy Morgan. Max, I ain't seen you in years. <laughs> wow, Tracy, you look terrific. Yo, I, I lost weight. I'm on that Walmart workout. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. It's that Walmart workout. <laughs> <laughs> what's up, man? Man. We surprised. We surprised, Buck. Yeah, no, I got. I was totally shocked. <laughs> the door opened behind us, and there was Dean. I love it. That's so exciting. Because Glick did mine. He did I did mine, his podcast uh, today. He did mine earlier. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, and good. And now I know Max is available to cast pods. Yeah. So now we now go. uh now I'll make sure we get you on the Father Muckin Protocol. Yeah. Y'all make sure to subscribe on all things comedy Father Muckin Protocol. Um. But yeah, when he told me that he was like, yeah, I'm going to uh I'm going to see Max later tonight. Uh, actually, Hugh Moore in the building, Rich Pierre Louis in the building. Hugh actually guest hosted with me. Uh, it was a lot of fun. We we had a lot of fun. Me and, me and Dean uh. Uh, starred in Shrek the Musical. Yes, he. You well, who, who'd you oh, yeah. play? I played. Uh, I, <laughs> I played the Shrek, and, and I played the donkey. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Eddie Murphy doesn't say donkey. He says if you if you watch the first couple of uh, Shreks, he he says donkey with like with a U. Uh, that's I think that's very very a New York thing. He says he says the donkey. He doesn't donkey. say do, he doesn't say uh, he doesn't enunciate and say donkey. He says he's like, nah, donkey was like it's funny, it's like a wow. you. How? Like Dunkin' Donuts, like donkey. Yeah. Well, you know, like I uh when we were working on that, um, they sent me to a, a voice person uh, yeah, yeah. so that I could learn the accent a yeah. little bit better. And then I came back and I did the accent and they were like, No, they liked what you more, did. More <laughs> more Canadian. Yeah. And I was like, Well, I am Canadian, so I can just do put so I had to yeah. like find ways of in you know, kind of mixing those two accents there together. were a lot of chefs in that kitchen <laughs> there were a lot of chefs there were too many chefs <laughs> too many chefs and we like spent the whole podcast and paprika. <laughs> how about basil <laughs> we would go in we would do a song him and me and sutton foster uh, uh the tony tony, tony, award winning, winning. tony so award winning tony award winning sutton foster yes. and uh we would do our uh, a song and the um and like jeff katzenberg or david geffen or one of these guys would literally take the one of them would go i love it and the other one would go it's garbage garbage and they'd rip it up and throw it in the trash can and be like start over write a new song right, yeah. tony winners right <laughs> and then these tony winning uh you know janine tesori janine tesori yeah. and david Lindsay bear yeah yeah who are t- uh, amazing i mean yeah, uh, yeah. janine wrote thoroughly modern did Billy he, win, and, well, he what did he win he won like a he, uh, well he wrote uh lincoln yeah, for uh, oh, he won the he wrote he wrote lincoln for spielberg yeah but before that but he, he won the he won the pulitzer yeah. the pulitzer yeah, yeah. the pulitzer Is is it Pulitzer or Pulitzer? Max, uh, well, I think what, it's Pulitzer. Did he write what, Angels in America? No, that's Tony mm-hmm. Kushner. Yeah. Tony Kushner, right? Okay. He wrote a musical with her as well, oh, uh, yeah. with with Janine. Yeah, yeah. He's a, they're they're super talented. Rabbit Hole or something? Rabbit Hole. Rabbit Hole. Rabbit yeah. Hole. With Cynthia Nixon. Yes. Yes. Oh yeah. Yes. Funny, funny dude. His <laughs> son actually was uh after we did the uh, the uh, workshop and the reading. Um, and I didn't, and we, and after Glickman and I got fired, <laughs> after, after they said, uh, after they said, we need stars, we need to fill, stack the cast with stars because people are going to know who's playing a green ogre, right? right exactly. And a dunk and a donkey. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, I remember uh, David uh, contacted me, contacted me, and he said uh, he was like, "Yeah, man, I, I I was really bummed." And more than that, my son 
was like, but, but Dean is going with us to Seattle. Right. And he was like, I was crushed. I had to tell my son that you weren't, he's like, I was rooting for you. I was like, all right, I appreciate it. And even, even, uh, yeah. Max's dad, like even stepped up to the, he, I, which I was like, this is this, hey, you know, his dad interjected and, and, hit up Katzenberg and was like, wow, yeah. you know what? I think Man. you're making a mistake. And Dean's really a talented and, you know, amazing. I was at, you know, after that, I was like, I was like, geez, you know, I, I it's just good family, man. Good, good, yeah. uh, good people. Well, and, and my dad was going on the advice of my son who loves Dean as an uncle right, and right, also right. loves sure. Shrek. <laughs> right. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, your dad also pulled that move with me with, um, when I was up for big time rush, I was, uh, I was uh, going to be a um, a reoccurring character on the show mm-hmm. uh, or a special guest on the show, but I wasn't going to be a series regular. Really? And we needed some sort of like thing to push their buttons at yeah. Nickelodeon. And so he had me out uh, for Young Frankenstein um, uh... and and like had me out there like they, he flew me out and I, you know, put me up and I had like the best time out there That's working awesome. on. I was there and met with Susan Stroman and had all this, this amazing time, you know, playing, you know, doing stuff. Oh, and wow. and then after while I was out there, uh, my manager took that as an opportunity to call Nickelodeon and say, Stephen's about to leave and go do Young Frankenstein. Mm. So if, you better give him series regular or he's going to be gone. Oh, and nice. they gave me series regular on the show. Wow. So thanks, of it. thanks to my dad. And I told told him i told him and he That's was like well awesome. i'm happy it worked so <laughs> my dad was... gave you a jaleel white moment <laughs> seriously <laughs> yeah, right <Yes. laughs> See, that's that's some serious stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah 100%. Funny. 100%. Funny. So you guys met, let's talk about where you guys met. How did how did this happen? We 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 met at SNL yeah. cuz we were uh I mean, I'll let Max tell it, but we both start our first official day of work was supposed to be September 11, 2001. <laughs> oh, <That's> holy right. <laughs> crap. Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah. We were the class of 9/11. Yeah. Yeah. Oh Man. my God! Yeah, that was our, our first episode. Yeah. Was with Giuliani and and the firemen yeah. on stage. Oh, it was with like, a, can we be funny? Yeah, now? yeah, yeah. Right. Why, go, why, why, why again? Well, why start now? Or <laughs> lips his lips, <laughs> <laughs> uh, chortle, chortle. You know, yeah. Jeez, that was the first first uh, episode, and uh, mm. we met that summer because I think in August. I almost want to say mm-hmm. it was like August thirteenth. Um, uh, oh right, because because you come in a couple weeks before to, to write yeah. the commercial parodies commercial they're going to shoot for the rest of the season, right? And right. that's actually a very low pressure, good way to meet people mm-hmm. and just hang out. Yeah, because they brought in like all the, the it was uh, Max, uh, Emily Spivey, right. Eric Kenward. I think I think he was there. Was like, he there a few the, months okay. before? But and then but Seth Seth, and Seth Myers uh, Jeff Richards right. wow. uh, who played yeah. Drunk Girl did Amy didn't have to though I don't think it, Amy Amy his was funny yeah. Amy was she came in with us but Amy was like the golden goose that that uh she you had know a lot of heat she at that she was time. from yeah. from UCB yeah. so yeah. she right. she had done she Conan like, and yeah. all that stuff yeah she was like, Conan's yeah. little sister on his show yeah. yeah so she didn't have to go through uh, <laughs> the the recruitee training. Yeah. That we all had to go through, yeah. which was fine, which yeah. was fine. I mean, and, and obviously based on her, her track record since yeah. then, it worked out. Yeah. You know? yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we just had Jeff Richards on the live version of this podcast oh, wow. on the nighttime show, the the actual nighttime show, uh, you know, the, the live show. And he mm-hmm. was oh God, he was yeah. amazing. Yeah, he closed. Funny. He did these amazing songs. The mm-hmm. guy is just a beast. Yeah, yeah. He's a funny so guy. So funny. Oh, Honestly, uh, Jeff, in my I still to this day say Jeff was that our first season even over amy i think she, jeff was the uh the hottest mm-hmm. new toy in the in the in the uh toy box sure because he had uh he had drunk girl yeah. and so anytime a show was was sort of weak and it wasn't as it didn't pop for those actually those two seasons anytime the show was was not as funny or as strong and there was like a dip in the energy of the show um lauren would say, you know what, I'd, um, you know what, uh, who wrote that? Paula wrote with him? I think it was Paula. Yeah, pa- Paula Pell, uh, one of the senior writers, her and Jeff would just go in the lab and, you know what, um, give us, let's, we need a, a drunk girl at the update desk with, with The Rock, you know, or whomever, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, and they would just, 
have have a funny moment in the episode, even if the rest of the episode was kind of just low energy. Yeah, and wasn't wasn't popping. Jeff Jeff was that dude, man. Yeah, wow. he was he was the show's Red Bull. Yeah, God. yeah, yeah, and he's so funny. I mean, his impressions are un- unbelievable. Yeah, he, he, yeah, he yeah. couldn't miss. He had who do he have? He had Letterman. He had Kevin Spacey. He had Bill O'Reilly. Bill O'Reilly. Uh, Dustin Hoffman. He had a That's lot right. of yeah, his Hoffman's hilarious. All yeah. of all of them. Jeff Jeff was uh, and a lot of them are people that nobody else was doing right. well that's you know? that's what's like when you i was listening and when you mentioned that uh you you wanted when you did the gi joe series which if y'all haven't gotten a chance to check mm. out i remember reading what was brilliant was there was no dialogue there was mm. there was no talking in in uh in the first one and, and it was just panels but you could see the pain and he was a father you know it, yeah. those were like great great issues and Max, similar to Jeff, similar to myself, um, as far as your approach, it's always more fun when you hit people that everybody else isn't doing. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So so yeah, totally Jeff doing Dustin Hoffman, everybody does Arnold Schwarzenegger. Right. Yeah. Everybody yeah. does, uh, uh, you know, Clinton, you know. Yeah. De Niro. Um, that's De Niro. Right. Yeah. Sure, yeah. You know, he said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find, you know, Letterman has an, an interesting tick. Yeah. You know, that's what that's one of the reasons he got hired on SNL. He was he was doing Letterman. He was doing yeah. Kevin. Sp- who's doing Kevin Spacey? Yeah. You know, with myself, I was doing Denzel Washington before people were doing Denzel Washington. Yeah. You know, those those yeah. those are more fun because it's it's also you're you're exploring the uh, uh, finding that nuance I'm that no one else has got. I'm when someone locks onto that cadence of someone where right, like, right. oh, they got it. Yeah. Because, like, a, a, yeah. like, that's what impresses me most is I'll right. see someone and I'll be like, oh, I didn't think you could do this person. Well, because nobody's paying you know? attention to right. it. Exactly, you know. But like, then- I saw I, Kevin Spacey, actually, I saw mm-hmm. do William Hurt. And I thought, there's oh, nothing yeah. Kevin to Spacey, do. Kevin Spacey, yo. How do you do that? Spacey and, was a comic. Right? Yeah. He was a comic and, and, he, and he did impressions and he, he killed brilliant. Him. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, yeah. also hanging out with Dean, because after we would, after the show, Dean would go do his stand-up gigs and sometimes right. I would I would sort of go just follow <laughs> him and watch him. And it was interesting because for me, as an artist, it was an amazing insight into what makes an artist. Right. And, yeah. and to me, what makes an artist is not the talent, it is the want. Mm. Sure. You know, sure. because I started life as an actor because my mom pushed me into it. My right. mom said, you're very talented. You should do it. You should do it. And I, I hated it. And I kept thinking there was something wrong with me. And watching Dean, I realized he he has to do this. Right. He right. has to. That red yeah. light goes on. He's there. I mean, right. I once watched him do a whole set uh, for nobody Except a Chinese family that didn't speak English. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> but damn it, he had that 15 minutes. He was not giving that up. No way. 100%. 100%. I once watched Artie Fuqua, I think, do his gig for nobody. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, think there yeah. was no one in the audience. Yeah, man. Oh, yeah. But no, that, 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 that drive yeah. is part, yeah, drive. It's part of you or it's yeah. not part right. of you. Right. And if it's not, right. that can't be learned. Right. I mean, no. you. Yeah, the only other person I've heard of doing that is Steve Martin, where a club booked him and they were like, uh, they can see you out the window, but they can't see the audience. So just right. do your act right. and people will come in eventually. Right. Right. Holy crap. Yeah. 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 And if you go to the comedy store sometimes at like, you know, yeah. there oh, are those yeah. spots at one o'clock in the morning when there's like four people in the room. Right. But, yeah. You know, but it doesn't matter. You have to do. You, you, have, you have to, have do, to it. do it. You know why you have to do those spots in particular to keep them from driving home? Because yeah. those, those four people mm. are liquored up. Yeah. Right. You're saving lives by doing time. <laughs> right, at right, time. Right. You know, that actually is the reason I learned that Jimi Hendrix played Star Spangled Banner. Oh, no kidding. I, from, what? From what I learned was Woodstock, well, he was at the end and mm-hmm. what, everybody was piling out. But, you mm-hmm. know, Woodstock was so badly managed mm-hmm. that they were in danger of having a riot because everybody was trying to get out at the same time and oh fights God. were breaking out. Oh. And so Hendrix ran up and, and he was like, OK, everybody hang out. Hey, listen to this. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I, I love Steve, Michael. I, I can't believe that you had that on your iPod. Oh yeah, to, to play just, right I, as we did. I had it queued up. <laughs> I had it queued up to play. 
Now, listen, now for, for your listeners, I'm going to I'm going to let you in on a on a trade craft secret of Dean Edwards. If you're watching him at a club late at night and he hey, I know exactly. Yeah, <laughs> and he and he starts just absentmindedly singing, loving you. You know he's tired. That's when you know it's been a long night and he's really tired. Because I used to watch him. He's about to wrap up. I was was like, oh. And after a while, I'm like, ah, he only does that when it's been a really long day. Wow. So did you guys, did you write? That is a good end of the night song, too. Yeah. Yeah. He puts you in the mood to sleep. Just an endless, mindless uh, thing. I used to, I would write with him. And you know what I was thinking of the other day? What's that? Slimy Corridor. Slimy Corridor. Still, I'm telling you, when I get my own skin. Show I read that probably six months ago, <laughs> and it still holds up, man. What is it? We we wrote a oh sketch. Here's uh, here's what I learned on SNL. Uh, like I, I think you said earlier that when you were auditioning for Mad TV, you did a Tracy Morgan. I did Tracy impression, and I did uh, yes, yeah, I did and, Tracy and I did George W. Bush. And they looked at him like it was crazy because right. that's not someone they that they would let him do right because they had yeah. uh, Aries and yeah. uh, Key and Peel <laughs> right and. So, why would they ever want me to be Tracy right, Morgan? Right, ever. And so, um, <laughs> so what? You, what I what I remember learning on SNL. I I always did well when I said to myself, "Oh, you know what? I gotta play. I'm I am a black cast member on the show. So let me so play to that strength. Just yeah. like Rachel Dretch. Right. Dr- Rachel didn't write herself being glamorous. Rachel wrote herself as being this odd character yeah, yeah. and she um, was great at it. and was she brilliant at it. It. yeah she's so, so funny so with slimy corridor <laughs> since we both grew up on on sci-fi we both yeah. we had similar interests that's how we okay. really bonded yeah, sure sure a lot of similar interests from from star wars to star trek and alien and so i don't remember i i, I remember saying how come every movie that takes place with aliens <laughs> There's always some dripping wet looking like first of all, there's always moisture in outer space. Yes. Right. But there's always a slimy metallic corridor with, with moisture dripping. And yeah. the brother's always the first one to die. They're always like, Johnson, go investigate that. And, you know, and then he dies. So yeah. our angle was, you know what? What if we write something where Johnson's <laughs> like uh, nah, Sarge, I'm good. Well, um, I don't, I, I don't really think we should go down there. You know, <laughs> Johnson, you need to get down there. We're, we're space marines, and you're gonna get down there. And, and then, and then, like Seth uh, Krasinski, Seth S. Krasinski's like, well, Sarge, I'll go down and, and investigate. And he goes down. And then you're like, oh no, I can't go down, please. <laughs> Johnson, go investigate what happened to Chris. You know, and so that was just the right. play on it. Yeah, and so and and who we did it twice. It was with Ray Romano first. Ray Romano, and first. he and he was like, you know, <laughs> come on, Johnson, we're all green, right? You know, Marines are all green, and you're like, yeah, why do I have to send the dark green right. Marine? Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was T. Sean Shannon's T-Shaw joke. Shannon, wow. Yeah. Oh my god. And then we, I think we brought it back with the Rock. We tried. Yeah, we yeah. resubmitted because it was funny. It you was know. Funny. The the worst part of the show had nothing to do with the show was at the end of a of a hard day because you know you you write all night and sure. then you sleep for like an hour and you come back and then all the sketches are read and then the worst part was afterwards we would watch a brand new show called Chappelle Show yeah oh dude oh, and it was this oh, force of nature yeah, shit. Yeah. it was there was doing all the shit you can't do oh. <laughs> and, and with, with yeah. the sensibility that right that and it was had, yeah, you know? and, yeah. and dave just he burned brighter than the sun yeah, yeah. yeah and and that's the thing like when when they said like oh he went crazy yeah remember we were talking about that yeah. like, he went to africa I was like, he went to dave wasn't in the bush right dave, yeah. k-town is a beautiful yeah. city it's like yeah. santa barbara yeah yeah and but I think uh, I think the, he had to do that because you know yeah. I remember my dad used to tell uh, stories about Sid Caesar mm. and how that because sh- Sid Caesar show was like SNL show show except yeah. it was all on him right yeah. and it destroyed him I mean it crushed this man that pressure year after year right. and I think Dave Chappelle on some level knew that I think he knew if I keep right. doing this right. I'm. I'm not going to come out of this alive. Right, right, right. And I think he saved his own life. I think he yeah. actually did the sanest thing he could do, right. which was like, look, 
the funniest thing we've done. It's all downhill from here. Right. Yeah. yeah so let's just I, I you know we got to wrap things up, but I I want to I want to touch on this because I found this to be really interesting. You talked about it a little bit at Comic Con. So, um, you know, I know that people always ask you questions about your dad and about your mom. Um, but what I kind of want to, I, so your, your father is Mel Brooks, mother is Anne Bancroft, uh, two, two of the greatest, mm. uh, entertainers in history. Um, but I, what I want to know about is your, the, like, because you had a lot of people that were coming around, you know, when you were a kid and that were like uncle, you know, they were yeah, like, yeah. they were just, it wasn't as much like who you were getting excited about to say, Oh my God, it's Sid Caesar. It was like, that's uncle Sid or that's mm-hmm. this one or that or uncle Carl Reiner, you know, right. people like this. Right. But what I kind of would like to know is, um, how did those, the other people who were coming around, how did they affect you? Cause you told a story at comic con about, um, you know, getting notes. Oh yeah. Yeah. No. Well, I mean, I, I was very, very lucky. My mentor was Alan Alda. Who, who basically took time out of his busy schedule to read my little like fantasy or action novellas hmm. and he would sit with me. How uh, old were you? I was uh, about 13, 14. There used to be a family friend, Julianne Griffin. She was Merv Griffin's ex and she had a house up in Mulholland. Basically, if you were famous from like 1975 to 1987, that's where you went. <laughs> that's where you played tennis. So like me and David DeLuise at eight years old would be playing $6 million man and on the tennis court would be Lee Majors. Mm. <laughs> oh my God. And so what Alan would do is I, I would send him my work and then he would – I'd see him that weekend. And then he, when he wasn't on the tennis court, he'd sit with me in the little tennis house and he would give me notes. And – they were brutal, but they were awesome. They mm. would, he would say things like, you actually have to research, Max. You have to – you can't have your two Muslim characters drinking beers. Uh, <laughs> you know, he, he would say things like, you have to have a beginning, middle, and an end. You have to have character motivations. Why? Why are they doing these things? So he really – he was instrumental in, in all wow. that. Oh, my wow. God. So, That's phenomenal. Yeah. As, and you know, as as a parent, you 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 hear stories like that, and you also realize how uh, how important uh, you know things like that, and 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 access. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, when you, when your children have access, because you weren't looking at him like, oh, that's Hawkeye, right? You were looking yeah. at him. Like this is an older older person, friend of the family, yeah, and yeah. and he, did, you know, salute to to Alan Alda and yeah, anyone seriously. that will sit down with a child because you've done that with with my kids. Right. My, my my daughter, uh, my eldest daughter is is very she's written oh my god books well, and such uh, and, uh, and Amori's art it it it's like Henry with his music like it, it when you see um, Dean's daughter draw. You flash back to Amadeus when Salieri is wow. watching Mozart and saying, <laughs> God is speaking through this man. Oh, I mean, it literally, I mean, it literally is like God carjacks her brain when she's drawn. <laughs> it's God. crazy. That's amazing. So, yeah. But, but he's, he's actually just saying, as you're telling me this, I'm like, oh, that's what you do. You do with the kids, yeah. but that's what you want because you, you really only want your kids to just have access so that they can say they can make their own decisions as opposed to you as a parent having to make decisions for them. Sure. You know, I get uh, that. Because that's, that's yeah. what you, you want what, in the grand scheme of things. When they get older, you want them to say, Oh, you know what? I had a chance. What, 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 yeah. what, what I did with that chance that was, that was, I either, uh, you know, ran with it or I flubbed it, you know, and dropped sure. the ball, but at least I had access. Oh, and totally it's true. Agree. And I think, I think as a parent, you want your kid to, to run in the circles where they can be influenced and also where they can just see people around them being right. successful at right. the, what they do. Whatever it is they love. Right. right. Yeah. And I think that's something that, that sometimes is lost on kids because they think some people become successes just because right. they don't sure. see the hard work. Work and the discipline right. and and the 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 try the fail the try the fail the right. keep going and I think it's important to put your kids in the situations where they see other people not their parents and they go oh wow it's a lot of hard work right. how does how does your son feel about your work about like what you do he doesn't I mean he doesn't really know because of all the zombie stuff mm-hmm. he he wants to know it but. 
you know, at this point, my greatest achievement is getting him to read because he didn't want to read. And then I brought him historical comic books. Mm. So that got him excited. Yeah. So like now he can't wait to see Hamilton. Mm. Mm. So, <laughs> oh, sure. Can we talk about Harlem? Harlem Hellfighters, Hellfighters? which wouldn't may not have happened had it not been for Mr. Edwards. <laughs> wow. Really? Yes. It's, a, it's absolutely phenomenal. If you haven't gotten to read it. You should. Uh, yeah. You got to pick it up. It's it's a uh, it's phenomenal, oh, wow. and I believe it's. Can we talk about what's happening with yeah, it? Or yeah. Not? Well, yeah. It, so it's it's been optioned uh, as a as a film. Is it in production or is it going? It's not in production? production yet. It's been optioned by Will Smith's company nice. by Overbrook, and and they're doing their best. And this was before the Oscars. I mean, he this was years ago. He he optioned the rights, and sure. he's been he's been swinging for this ever since. So. Yeah. Say, so, a, will you tell us? say a fella didn't know what it was about. Would, right. you, would you tell <laughs> us just a little bit about it? All right. Now, and get this. World War I was the first war we ever fought to make the world safe for democracy. You know, every right. politician's used that since then. You know, we're going to make the world a better place. Mm-hmm. Well, that all started in World War I because it's like, why would we get involved? Mm, right. there, there's no point. And so Woodrow Wilson was like, oh, crap. How do I sell the American people? He's like, we fight for ideals. Mm-hmm. Well, it's a little hypocritical when you're fighting for <laughs> democracy and like women can't vote yet. Mm. Yeah. Native Americans are, are treated like wildlife and black people are, are treated like, boot. yeah. Mm-hmm. So he understood, Oh crap. There's this unit of African American soldiers who want to make the world safe for democracy. And if they succeed, they're going to come home and <laughs> demand it here. Yeah. So the American government literally tried to sabotage this group of black soldiers. Mm. They gave them poor weapons, poor training. Wow. They sent them to train in the South, hoping there'd be a race riot. Oh uh, they, they wouldn't let them march in the parade off to war. It was called the Rainbow Division. All the other units were together in the Rainbow Shit. Division. They were told black is not a color of the rainbow, so they didn't get to march. Oh, <laughs> I always wow. love the ways that they crap. Yeah. Then they, so they, they got sent over to France to dig ditches instead of fight. And then when they <laughs> demanded to fight, they were given to the French, <laughs> given to the French army as yeah. replacement troops. And the French were so depleted oh, and had used African troops they, in their reverse racism. They thought, well, maybe all black people can fight. <laughs> so the first American hero of World War I was a black guy, Henry Johnson. Little guy. I mean, this, this little Mark Theobald, Kevin Hart guy <laughs> took on 40 big Gunther Germans <laughs> with nothing but a knife. And it took him 100 years to finally get the Medal of Honor. He just got it this year. Mm. Last year, actually. Wow. And so... I tried to write it as a movie in the 90s. Nobody wanted it. And I kept it in a drawer. And I'm sitting in my office with Dean, one of our, <laughs> one of our long nights. Yeah. And Dean goes, I always wanted as an actor just to do a scene where I get shot in the head. Like, you know, you, you look over a wall or something around a corner. And I was like, funny, you should say that. I have a script where that happens. So he he... You told me. I remember yeah. you told me about it. I was like, I, I get excited about good ideas. I'm sure. like, dude, yeah. that's that's dope. And yeah. so he kept prodding me. He kept saying, like, how's it going? How's it going? And then finally, when when I got into writing, when I got into publishing books and comic books, you kept calling me. You're like, so what's happening with that? And I'm like, I'm gonna do something with this. So and that was my dad. You know who I got that from? My dad because my dad always was like, you know what? If you have a good idea. Um, he did that with Tracy, with my wife, with her her books. He would always say, "What's what's what? What did you got? Did you did you finish it? Get it out there. Just sure. just write it. Just just get it. You know." And and so that's why I always just bugged him. I was like, "Dude, this is, I mean, it's a it's a great idea." And also as 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 a black man, I was like, "That's that's a story yeah. that 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 should be you told. want people to know about." You yeah. know, yeah. What I found so fascinating when you were telling the the story about it at Comic Con was that instead of it instead of uh, just writing a book or turning the script into a book, you turned it into a graphic novel. So yeah. that people, when they are reading it, they're constantly reminded of who the story's about. Mm. Well, it's got to be visual because yeah. cause, cause racism is visual. Right. You know? right. so, and also I wanted to do it as a comic book because I grew up with dyslexia. Reading was really hard for me mm-hmm. and I wouldn't have learned how to read if it wasn't for comic books. Mm. So mm-hmm. I automatic – my default point are the kids who are not natural readers. And I thought if I write this as a novel – it's going to be read by 50-something white men who watch the History Channel who already know this story. Right. Mm-hmm. I want to make it accessible to young people uh, and get it out there. And the best way to do that, I think, is comic books because it's the only thing I see most kids voluntarily pick up and read. Mm-hmm. Completely. You know, it's like yeah. when we were kids, yeah. they were always like, turn off the TV, turn off the TV. Well, the TV's like w- – 
a voice in a chorus now of digital distraction. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. How do you get a right. kid to actually pick up any book? Right. You, get, you can't tell a kid, go to your room. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> got my iPad, I got Wi Fi in there. Right. Right. Oh, right. oh, you mean go to my room and plug in with the world? Right. Yeah. Right. Easy. So how do you do it? So comic books to me is a great educational tool. I think I think all all teachers should have comic books in the classroom. I agree. I, yeah, that's I, I totally agree with you. I on remember that. when I first read three hundred. Oh yeah, mm. thinking I wish they'd had something like this when I was a little kid. Right, mm-hmm. that was about different historical events and stuff like that. Yeah, but you know, I I knew like you know there he's taken a lot of creative license yeah. here. But it got me interested in the story, right? You know, right. and and into like when the History Channel showed a thing on the Battle of Thermopylae, I was like, oh, I right. want to watch that now. You don't you, ass- know? you don't assume every kid who reads it is going to want to read more. But if if a hundred right. kids read uh, three hundred, five yeah. or six are going to go deeper. Go deeper, yeah. Yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. my my dad was like my dad. God bless he uh, he. I, one day I was and and you you and my dad uh, got along really he well. He was great. Dean's dad was a wonderful man. He was a sci fi nerd, so. sci fi and history buff. Yeah, wow. I was never into history, and <laughs> so one day I just I said to him, I said, so why why you how'd you do so well? Because I didn't <laughs> do well in <laughs> yeah. history in school. He was like, I just I loved the stories. I looked at them like they were adventures. Yeah, you know, like how you're describing. You know, right. they were right. adventures. <laughs> And I just envisioned the stories like like these movies and comic books, and that's and so it, they became exciting to me as opposed to just rote um, Bueller, Bueller, just just yeah, yeah. Sure. You know, the same exactly. old dictation. Yeah. Oh yeah, of, of, the of, enemy of history is history teachers, right? Oh, yeah. Cause, right, because right. they naturally yeah. love history, and therefore they can't understand why other kids aren't. It's like English teachers; mm. they were always that nerd sitting in the back of the class with a book. Right, they right. gravitated towards reading. Right. Reading was their first mm. love, so they can't understand understand why some of the kids aren't interested right yeah i had yeah. only one teacher uh growing up uh, i had a teacher named mr westermeyer when i was in seventh grade he was a, a history teacher and he made history really exciting mm-hmm. and it completely changed my opinion because before that i really didn't care about it and right. and then i had this like one teacher and it, still after that it really like you know, it's one of those things that, like, you try to find, you know, because you're trying to relate to it. You're, you're a to creative. Like, you're to, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm a, you're a creative. Because you're a creative, I, I, had, I always have a theory um, to this day that uh, when you are creative, everybody at this table is a creative. And so you did, I guarantee you, we all did well in school when you had a teacher like Mr. Westermeyer. Right, sure. That, yep, that right. could... <clears throat> show you a way that it was exciting and, and how you could relate to it completely. You know, my, mine was Mr. Hickey in third grade. Yeah. He got me. He, he, he yeah. said, you know, what? this odd kid that walks around singing and making noise, <laughs> do that, yeah. do yeah. that. And so that's, I'm the same. When I see, I see my children acting, doing their weird thing or they're in the corner. I'm like, let them, let them live. Let right. them you know what? This is a I have to say Mr. Cooksey and Mr. Rossman. Just because people are naming teachers, oh, yeah. sure. Sure. I, I'm not leaving mine out. <laughs> right, right. I love it. Lar- Larry so Moore said, "Tenth grade yeah. Western yeah. Civ two, yeah, yeah. changed yeah. everything." Yeah. Yeah. I love it. You know, it's so funny when I was in uh, when I was in like fourth grade, uh, third fourth grade. I my uh, my teacher called the like had had me had my mom go to the school counselor to like sit down with like the school counselor and me because I was getting in trouble in class for. Uh, uh, playing with my hands and making like my hands little like men that like with like finger fighter guys. So I like was playing. I was like playing, or I do magic tricks. I do right. like magic tricks with like coins or whatever. I was always <laughs> playing around and like right. doing yeah. things and uh, telling weird stories. And and I always wanted to like come up on in front of everyone and make up a story. And uh, like I was just it was just a weird kid. And so the counselor sat down my mom and me in the cl- in this little room, and he was like. Um, she was like, what are we supposed to do? Do we need to put him in special classes? You know, I I heard that he's not doing very well in math and this and this and this. And he said, your son does not need to be good at math because he will have someone who will do that for him. 
That, mm. Thank because God somebody is, says that. Yeah. He's yeah. so great at all this other stuff. This is the part it's I, I don't understand this about education. In the working yeah. world, you have to do one thing really, really well. Right. And that's it. Like right. if, you're, yeah. if, right. you're, if you're really good at right. computers and you go for a job at Google, no one's going to say, well, your coding skills are amazing. But here, read this Emily Bronte book <laughs> and write a book report. Right. Yeah. And if it's not right. good, we won't hire you to write code right. for our computers. Right. Mm-hmm. Why is it in the working world, it's all about specialization and then in the education world, it's all about general ed. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's, well, because is it because it's easy, the way I see uh, a lot of uh, um, you know, especially American uh, education, it's about creating workers and not uh, leaders and people that are, yep. that are going to think yeah. for themselves. It's easier here. Let's create the workforce. Let's create people that are going to uh, co- um, uh, conform and and follow and say, you know, I don't yeah. need to strive for better. I'll, I'm happy just being right, right in the middle. Yeah. I had the same way you had a teacher that said he he'll he'll need some. I had Miss Levine. Uh, had her in first grade, and then she followed me and went to fourth grade. I was like, "This lady oh. does not like me." And <laughs> like, and to be six years old and say this person is <laughs> not an like enemy. me, yeah. Yeah. like Seriously. it's just it's very in, very. It opens your mind because you're like, yeah. "No, she does not like." I remember this woman saying to me. Uh, Mr. Edwards, she was like, you're, you're sloppy. Your desk, look at your desk. You're going to need a maid one day. And I remember saying, well, I, I guess I'll have a maid. You know yeah, what I mean? Because yeah. I, I was, yeah. uh, and it wasn't even arrogance. It was just like, I remember saying, wow, she just, why is she being so mean to me? Yeah. I didn't, I, and, and, and I always yeah. got the, the report cards that said from any teacher, Dean has the ability to do better, but he spends too much time daydreaming. And the only teacher that never really wrote that was Mr. Hickey. Mm-hmm. And Miss Dudley, because they were like, you know, what he he has a he has his way of learning, and if I if I give him the freedom to take to to uh, take in the information a certain way, he does well on the test. Exactly. You know? yeah, sure. And here's here's what I don't understand is you go into any classroom in America and you see pictures of people like Mark Twain and Frederick Douglass and Thomas Edison and Steve Jobs, and yet none of these successful adults would be the kind of children that these teachers would want. In their exactly. class, Absolutely right. Right. Absolutely Absolutely if you could totally take right. all those people on the walls right. and yeah. and make them kids again, right. none of those teachers right. would yeah, want that. Willful, arrogant, right. loud, daydreaming. Right. Yeah. Right. That's a hundred percent on the money. That's amazing. Uh, we, we can uh, we're gonna uh, end this for the our first episode of the nighttime show podcast. But as before, I end it. I have to say one thing, Max. Uh, we're family. Right? Yes, we are. Uh, you did this thing that uh, is hilarious uh, that I, I just want to share with everybody in the room that I think is amazing. When World, well, not World War Z, but the Zombie Survival Guide. Yes. Uh, so before World War Z came out, you wrote the Zombie Survival Guide. You gave copies of this uh, to some people, I believe, but most of my family, aunts, uncles, yep. elderly people, mm-hmm. went out and purchased copies of the books so that we would all know what was what was going on and i will never forget as long as i live we went to i think it was passover and my my some elderly 75 year old aunt was like i read this book that max wrote and it's all about the zombies and we have to protect ourselves from the, the zombies and i don't know what i'm supposed to do if i go to the store and fill up the the closet with bottles of water. Should we nail the door shut? I don't. I, I'm trying to understand if it's for now or for later. I don't know what's happening with this book. I just never forget panicking at Passover about about if the guide was for like right now or if it was for later. And it was so great. That's the title of my next book: Panicking, panicking for Passover. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, Max! Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for coming at work. I know that you're not on a lot of social media stuff, but where can they find you? You know my uh, you? my website, maxbrooks.com. I mean, uh, if if I do do something, you'll you'll probably hear about it there. Are you going to be at Comic Con again this year? I think so. I mean, I'm usually at Comic Con, and if you're there, we'll 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 do something. We'll get I, you up on stage again. I would love that, <laughs> um, Dean. Where can they find you? Uh, at I am Dean Edwards on social media and. Uh, 
Yeah, on on your TV and, and uh, film screens real soon. Yeah, if if they're if they're in New York, where should they come see you? Do stand-up? Uh, you can catch me Gotham Comedy Club, uh, Stand Up New York, uh, uh, Caroline's Com- all over. Yeah, the comic all, strip live. What know, about wherever, when you're wherever. here in L.A.? Anytime I'm here, actually, uh, you can catch me right downstairs at the Improv on on Melrose or the Laugh Factory. Um, you know, getting getting these these mics burning stages. That's man. what I'm talking about. And Mike Black, where can they uh, check you out? Uh, oh. At my place in Koreatown, <laughs> 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 or sometimes I'll be at Nick's check cashing. Oh, uh, I love that place. Me and this other guy like to go in on a bowl of ramen together. <laughs> and, <laughs> like no, uh, you can find me uh, at Mike Black Attack on all social media. Yeah. So that's the it, easiest. It's way. the be- you're uh, you're Instagram. most of what I do is what you do. So it feels know, weird to plug to we, double plug it. So. We really do. Oh, and you so know what? The yeah. Father Mokin Protocol uh, on all things Comedy Network. You can check it out on iTunes or, or SoundCloud. Absolutely. The Father Mokin Protocol. Um, <laughs> That's a great uh, title. Keep, keep, keep an ear out. Um, like I said, we just did two hours with Glickman and, and Hugh Moore in the back, and uh, and we'll we'll have uh, Max on there oh, yeah. soon, too. Yeah, it was really fun. Now, now what about great. Bobby Bathroom? Where can we find oh, it? Oh, yeah. Robbie, Robbie, get, out, sweet, get on in here. Tell us where Robbie they can Carlisle. find you. Robbie, our our show mascot. Uh, you can usually find me uh, pantless in uh, Chinatown. <laughs> <laughs> at Ralph. Oh, yeah, God. Ralph. You, if you Ralph. guys haven't seen oh, the video. That, that was the guy. That, this is Robbie. We oh. had Robbie run shirtless and pantsless in just little underwear <laughs> all the way through uh, old time, old town uh, Chinatown in, like, in downtown Los Angeles, holding our show sign, screaming at the top of his lungs oh while God. we shot confetti cannons at him without like any permits. Like We just literally and attacked yet- Robbie. Bobby Ironically, that's pro- that's probably what you would see on Chinese television. Probably, yeah. <laughs> probably. That's basically uh, like every show. We yeah. went it was way over budget. Oh god, that. it was the most fun I've had in a long time. And Robbie's always down to like do sketches with us every show, and he's absolutely hilarious. Uh, Robbie, where can they find you? Do they? Did, where can they actually get you? Uh, I'm at Robbie Carlisle on Twitter. Um, I Carlisle. Oh yeah, good question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, I gotta get the the American version. Uh, my dad spelled it C A R L Y S L E. Just uh, uh. and is that how we should spell it when we're looking for you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. You made that really convoluted, Robbie. How? Yeah. How the spell fuck do people Carlisle. find you, Robbie? And that spelling is the Yiddish version for <laughs> I'm not Jewish. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can uh, you if you guys are in in Los Angeles, uh, March nineteenth is the nighttime show at the Hollywood Improv, ten p.m. show. Fireball Whiskey is giving away a hundred uh, shots to the audience oh uh, p- uh, prior to the show, which is absolutely incredible. That'll make the show funnier. Oh God, <laughs> does it really, really does? Um, our lineup for that night so far is Ari Shafir. Taylor Williamson, Mike O'Connell, Rick Ingram, Damn. and we're uh, we are really hoping uh, we're, we're, for... we're working on my wife letting me uh, leave. <laughs> yes, oh, yeah. oh, right, right, right. right. We're so, trying right. to get. Dean. I might be there, Sweet. and uh, and some other wonderful guests, including. And if you're listening to this, uh, then you know the big secret is uh, Drake Bell from Drake and Josh will be on the show as well. Nice. Uh, but uh, lots of wonderful people. Uh, Robbie will be there, and we're gonna have a, a great time. And um, we have so many wonderful guests coming up on the nighttime show podcast. Podcast, so make sure to subscribe. Uh, you can get me at Stephen Glickman, S T E P H E N Glickman, on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, I love you guys. Thank you so much for being here. This has been the Nighttime Show Podcast. Hello. Oh, hello.